Chapter three of Moonfleet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers. Moonfleet by J. Mead Faulkner. Chapter three. A discovery. Some bold adventurers disdain the limits of their little reign, and unknown regions dare descry. Still. As they run, they look behind, they hear a voice in every wind, and snatch a fearful joy. Gray. I have said that I used often in the daytime, when not at school, to go to the churchyard, because, being on a little rise, there was the best view of the sea to be had from it, and on a fine day you could watch the French privateers creeping along the cliffs under the snout, and lying in wait for an Indiaman or up-channel trader. There were at Moonfleet few boys of my own age, and none that I cared to make my companion. So I was given to muse alone, and did so for the most part in the open air, all the more because my aunt did not like to see an idle boy with muddy boots about her house. For a few weeks, indeed, after the day that I had surprised Elzevir and Ratsey, I kept away from the church, fearing to meet them there again. But a little later resumed my visits, and saw no more of them. Now my favourite seat in the churchyard was the flat top of a raised stone tomb, which stands on the south-east of the church. I have heard Mr. Dennis call it an altar-tomb, and in its day it had been a fine monument, being carved around with festoons of fruit and flowers. But had suffered so much from the weather, that I never was able to read the lettering on it, or to find out who had been buried beneath. Here I chose most to sit not only because it had a flat and convenient top, but because it was screened from the wind by a thick clump of yew-trees. These yews had once, I think, completely surrounded it, but had either died or been cut down on the south side, so that any one sitting on the grave-top was snug from the weather, and yet possessed a fine pr prospect over the sea. On the other three sides the yews grew close and thick, embarring the tomb like the high back of a far-side chair. And many times in autumn I have seen the stone slab crimson with the fallen waxy berries, and taken some home to my aunt, who liked to taste them with a glass of slow gin after her Sunday dinner. Others beside me, no doubt, found this tomb a comfortable seat and lookout, for there was quite a path worn to it on the south side, though all the times I had visited it I had never seen any one there. So it came about that on a certain afternoon in the beginning of February, in the year 1758, I was sitting on this tomb looking out to sea. Though it was so early in the year, the air was soft and warm as a May day, and so still that I could hear the drumming of turnips that Gaffer George was flinging into a cart on the hillside near half a mile away. Ever since the floods of which I have spoken the weather had been open, but with high winds and little or no rain. Thus, as the land dried after the floods, there began to open cracks in the heavy clay soil on which Moonfleet is built, such as are usually only seen with us in the height of summer. There were cracks by the side of the path in the sea-meadows between the village and the church, and cracks in the churchyard itself, and one running right up to this very tomb. It must have been past four o'clock in the afternoon, and I was for returning to tea at my aunt's when underneath the stone on which I sat I heard a rumbling and crumbling, and on jumping off saw that the crack in the ground had still further widened just where it came up to the tomb, and that the dry earth had so shrunk and settled that there was a hole in the ground a foot or more across. Now this hole reached under the big stone that formed one side of the tomb, and, falling on my hands and knees and looking down it, I perceived that there was under the monument a larger cavity into which the hole opened. I believe there never was boy yet who saw a hole in the ground, or a cave in a hill, or much more an underground passage, but longed incontinently to be into it, and discover whither it led. So it was with me, and seeing that the earth had fallen enough into the hole to open a way under the stone, I slipped myself in, feet foremost, dropped down on to a heap of fallen mould, and found that I could stand upright under the monument itself. Now this was what I had expected, for I thought that there had been below this grave a vault, 
the roof of which had given way and let the earth fall in. But as soon as my eyes were used to the dimmer light, I saw that it was no such thing, but that the hole into which I had crept was only the mouth of a passage which sloped gently down in the direction of the church. My heart fell to thumping with eagerness and surprise, for I thought I had made a wonderful discovery, and that this hidden way would certainly lead to great things, perhaps even to Blackbeard's hoard. For ever since Mr. Lenny's tale, I had constantly before my eyes a vision of the diamond and the wealth it was to bring me. The passage was two paces broad, as high as a tall man, and cut through the soil, without bricks or any other lining. And what surprised me most was that it did not seem deserted nor mouldy and cobweb, as one who expects such a place to be, but rather a well-used thoroughfare for I could see the soft clay floor was trodden with the prints of many boots, and marked with a trail, as if some heavy thing had been dragged over it. So I set out down the passage, reaching out my hand before me lest I should run against anything in the dark, and sliding my feet slowly to avoid pitfalls in the floor. But before I had gone half a dozen paces, the darkness grew so black that I was frightened, and so far from going on was glad to turn sharp about, and see the glimmer of light that came in through the hole under the tomb. Then a horror of the darkness seized me, and before I well knew what I was about, I found myself wriggling my body up under the tombstone onto the churchyard grass, and was once more in the low evening sunlight and the soft, sweet air. Home I ran to my aunt's, for it was past tea-time, and beside that I knew I must fetch a candle if I were ever to search out the passage and to search it I had well made up my mind, no matter how much I was scared for this moment. My aunt gave me but a sorry greeting when I came into the kitchen, for I was late and hot. She never said much when displeased, but had a way of saying nothing which was much worse, and would only reply yes or no, and that after an interval, to anything that was asked of her. So the meal was silent enough, for she had finished before I had arrived and I ate but little myself, being too much occupied with the thought of my strange discovery, and finding beside the tea lukewarm, and the victuals not enticing. You may guess that I said nothing of what I had seen, but made up my mind that as soon as my aunt's back was turned, I would get a candle and tinder-box, and return to the churchyard. The sun was down before Aunt Jane gave thanks for what we had received, and then, turning to me, she said in a cold and measured voice, "'John, I have observed that you are often out and about of nights, sometimes as late as half-past seven or eight. Now it is not seemly for young folk to be abroad after dark, and I do not choose that my nephew should be called a gadabout. What's bred in the bone will I come out in the flesh. And twas with such loafing that your father began his wild ways, and afterwards led my poor sister such a life as never was, till the mercy of Providence took him away.' Aunt Jane often spoke thus of my father, whom I never remembered, but believed him to have been an honest man and good fellow to boot, if something given to roaming and to contraband. "'So understand,' she went on, "'that I will not have you out again this evening, no, nor any other evening, after dusk. Bed is the place for youth when night falls, but if this seem to you too early you can sit with me for an hour in the parlour, and I will read your discourse of Dr. Sherlock that will banish vain thoughts.' and leave you in a fit frame for quiet sleep." So she led the way into the parlour, took the book from the shelf, put it on the table within the little circle of light cast by a shaded candle, and began. It was dull enough, though I had borne such tribulations before, and the drone of my aunt's voice would have sent me to sleep, as it had done at other times, even in a straight-backed chair, had I not been so full of my discovery, and chafed at this delay. Thus, all the time my aunt read of spiritualities and saving grace, I had my mind on diamonds and all kinds of mammon, for I never doubted that Blackbeard's treasure would be found at the end of that secret passage. The sermon finished at last, and my aunt closed the book with a stiff good-night for me. I was for giving her my formal kiss, but she made as if she did not see me, and turned away. So we went upstairs, each to our own room, and I never kissed Aunt Jane again. 
There was a moon three-quarters full already in the sky, and on moonlight nights I was allowed no candle to show me to bed. But on that night I needed none, for I never took off my clothes, having resolved to wait till my aunt was asleep, and then, ghosts or no ghosts, to make my way back to the churchyard. I did not dare to put off that visit even till the morning, lest some chance passer-by should light upon the whole, and so forestall me with Blackbeard's treasure. Thus I lay wide awake on my bed, watching the shadow of the tester-post against the whitewashed wall, and noting how it had moved by degrees as the moon went farther round. At last, just as it touched the picture of the good shepherd which hung over the mantelpiece, I heard my aunt snoring in her room, and knew that I was free. Yet I waited a few minutes, so that she might get well on with her first sleep, and then took off my boots, and in stockinged feet slipped past her room and down the stairs. How stair, handrail, and landing creaked that night, and how my feet and body struck noisily against things seen quite well, but misjudged in the effort not to misjudge them. And yet there was the note of safety still sounding, for the snoring never ceased, and the sleeper woke not, though her waking then might have changed all my life. So I came safely to the kitchen, and there put in my pocket one of the best winter candles and the tinder-box, and as I crept out of the room, heard suddenly how loud the old clock was ticking, and looking up, saw the bright brass band marking half-past ten on the dial. Out in the street, I kept in the shadow of the houses as far as I might, though all was silent as the grave. Indeed, I think that when the moon is bright, a great hush falls always upon nature, as though she was taken up in wondering at her own beauty. Every one was fast asleep in Moonfleet, and there was no light in any window. Only when I came opposite the Why Not, I saw from the red glow behind the curtains that the bottom room was lit up, so Elzevir was not yet gone to bed. It was strange, for the Why Not had been shut up early for many a long night past, and I crossed over cautiously to see if I could make out what was going forward. But that was not to be done, for the panes were thickly steamed over, and this surprised me more as showing that there was a good company inside. Moreover, as I stood and listened, I could hear a mutter of deep voices inside, not as of roisterers, but of sober men talking low. Eagerness would not let me wait long, and I was off across the meadows towards the church, though not without sad misgivings as soon as the last house was left well behind me. At the churchyard wall my courage had waned somewhat. It seemed a shameless thing to come to rifle Blackbeard's treasure just in the very place and hour that Blackbeard loved, and as I passed the turnstile I half expected that a tall figure, hairy and evil-eyed, would spring out from the shadow on the north side of the church. But nothing stirred, and the frosty grass sounded crisp under my feet as I made across the churchyard, stepping over the graves and keeping always out of the shadows, towards the black clump of yew-trees on the far side. When I got round the yews, there was the tomb standing out white against them, and at the foot of the tomb was the hole, like a patch of black velvet spread upon the ground it was so dark. Then, for a moment, I thought that Blackbeard might be lying in wait in the bottom of the hole, and I stood uncertain whether to go on or back. I could catch the rustle of the water on the beach, not of any waves, for the bay was smooth as glass, but just a lipper at the fringe, and wishing to put off with any excuse the descent into the passage, though I had quite resolved to make it, I settled with myself that I would count the water wash twenty times and at the twentieth would let myself down into the hole. Only seven wavelets had come in when I forgot to count, for there, right in the middle of the moon's path across the water, lay a lugger moored broadside to the beach. She was about half a mile out, but there was no mistake, for though her sails were lowered, her masts and hull stood out black against the moonlight. Here was a fresh reason for delay, for surely one must consider what this craft could be, and what had brought her here. She was too small for a privateer, too large for a fresh fishing smack, and could not be a revenue boat by her low freeboard in the waist. 
and was a strange thing for a boat to cast anchor in the midst of Moonfleet Bay, even on a night so fine as this. Then, while I watched, I saw a blue flare in the bows, only for a moment, as if a man had lit a squib and flung it overboard. But I knew from it she was a contrabandia, and signalling either to the shore or to a mate in the offing. With that, courage came back and I resolved to make this flare my signal for getting down into the hull, screwing my heart up with the thought that if Blackbeard was really waiting for me there, it would be little good to turn tail now, for he would be after me, and would certainly run much faster than I could. Then I took one last look round, and down into the hull forthwith, the same way as I had got down earlier in the day. So on that February night, John Trenchard, found himself standing in the heap of loose fallen mould at the bottom of the hole, with a mixture of courage and cowardice in his heart, but overruling all, a great desire to get at Blackbeard's diamond. Out came tinder-box and candle, and I was glad indeed when the lights burned up bright enough to show that no one at any rate was standing by my side. But then there was the passage, and who could say what might be lurking there? Yet I did not falter, but set out on this adventurous journey, walking very slowly indeed, for that was from fear of pitfalls, and nerving myself with the thought of the great diamond which surely would be found at the end of the passage. What should I not be able to do with such wealth? I would buy a nag for Mr. Glenny, a new boat for Ratsey, and a silk gown for Aunt Jane, in spite of her being so hard with me as on this night. And thus, I would make myself the greatest man in Moonfleet, richer even than Mr. Maskew, and build a stone house in the sea-meadows, with a good prospect of the sea, and marry Grace Maskew, and live happily, and fish. I walked on down the passage, reaching out the candle as far as might be in front of me, and whistling to keep myself company, yet saw neither Blackbeard nor any one else. All the way there were footprints on the floor and the roof was black as with smoke of torches, and this made me fear lest some of those who had been there before might have made away with the diamond. Now, though I have spoken of this journey down the passage as though it were a mile long, and though it verily seemed so to me that night, yet I afterwards found it was no more than twenty yards or thereabouts. And then I came upon a stone wall which had once blocked the road, but was now broken through so as to make a ragged doorway into a chamber beyond. There I stood, on the rough sill of the door, holding my breath and reaching out my candle arm's length into the darkness, to see what sort of a place this was before I put foot into it. And before the light had well time to fall on things, I knew that I was underneath the church, and that this chamber was none other than the Mahoon vault. It was a large room, much larger, I think, than the schoolroom where Mr. Lenny taught us, but not near so high, being only some nine feet from floor to roof. I say floor, then in reality there was none but only a bottom of soft, wet sand. And when I stepped down on to it, my heart beat very fiercely, for I remembered what manner of place I was entering, and the dreadful sounds which had issued from it that Sunday morning so short a time before. I satisfied myself that there was nothing evil lurking in the dark corners, or nothing visible at least, and then began to look round and note what was to be seen. Walls and roof were stone, and at one end was a staircase closed by a great flat stone at top, that same stone which I had often seen with a ring in it in the floor of the church above. All round the sides were stone shelves, with the divisions between them like great bookcases. But instead of books, there were the coffins of the Mahoons. Yet these lay only at the sides, and in the middle of the room was something very different, for here were stacked scores of casks, kegs, and runlets, from a storage butt that might hold thirty gallons down to a breaker that held only one. They were marked, all of them, in white paint on the end with figures and letters, that doubtless set forth the quality to those that understood. Here indeed was a discovery and instead of picking up at the end of the passage a little brass or silver casket, which had only to be opened to show Blackbeard's diamond gleaming inside, I had stumbled on the Mahoon's vault, and found it to be nothing but a cellar 
of gentlemen of the contraband, for surely good liquor would never be stored in so shy a place if it ever had paid the excise. As I walked round this stack of casks, my foot struck sharply on the edge of a butt, which must have been near empty, and straightway came from it the same hollow, booming sound, only fainter, which had so frightened us in church that Sunday morning. So it was the casks, and not the coffins, that had been knocking one against another, and I was pleased with myself, remembering how I had reasoned that coffin wood could never give that booming sound. It was plain enough that the whole place had been under water. The floor was still muddy, and the green and sweating walls showed the flood mark within two feet of the roof. There was a wisp or two of fine seaweed that had somehow got in, and a small crab was still alive and scuttled across the corner. Yet the coffins were but little disturbed. They lay on their shelves in rows, one above the other, and numbered twenty-three in all. Most were in lead, and so could never float, but of those in wood some were turned slantways in their niches, and one had floated right away and been left on the floor upside down in a corner when the waters went back. First I fell to wondering as to whose cellar this was, and how so much liquor could have been brought in with secrecy, and how it was I had never seen anything of the contraband men, though it was clear that they had made this flat tomb the entrance to their storehouse, as I had made it my seat. And then I remembered how Ratsey had tried to scare me with talk of Blackbeard, and how Elzevir, who had never been seen at church before, was there the Sunday of the noises, and how he had looked ill at ease whenever the noise came, though he was as bold as a lion, and how I had tripped upon him and Ratsey in the Kirk churchyard, and how Master Ratsey lay with his ear to the wall. And putting all these things together, and casting them up, I thought that Elzevir and Ratsey knew as much as any about this hiding-place. These reflections gave me more courage, for I considered that the tales of Blackbeard walking or digging among the graves had been set afloat to keep those that were not wanted from the place, and guessed now that when I saw the light moving in the churchyard that night I went to fetch Dr. Hawkins, it was no corpse-candle, but a lantern of smugglers running a cargo. Then. Having settled these important matters, I began to turn over in my mind how to get at the treasure, and herein was much cast down, for in this place was neither casket nor diamond, but only coffins and double hollands. So it was, that having no better plan, I set to work to see whether I could learn anything from the coffins themselves, but with little success, for the lead coffins had no names upon them, and on such of the wooden coffins as bore plates I found the writing to be Latin and so rusted over, that I could make nothing of it. Soon I wished I had not come at all, considering that the diamond had vanished into air, and it was a sad thing to be cabined with so many dead men. It moved me, too, to see pieces of banners and funeral shields, and even shreds of wreaths that dear hearts had put there a century ago, now all ruined and rotten, some still clinging, water-sodden, to the coffins, and some trampled in the sand of the floor. I had spent some time in this bootless search, and was resolved to give up further inquiry and foot it home, when the clock in the tower struck midnight. Surely never was ghostly hour sounded in more ghostly place. Moonfleet Peel was known over half the county, and the finest part of it was the clock bell. It was said that in times past, when perhaps the chimes were rung more often than now, the voice of this bell had led safe home boats that were lost in the fog, and this night its clangour, mellow and profound, reached even to the vault. Bim-bom, it went, bim-bom, twelve heavy thuds that shook the walls, twelve resonant echoes that followed, and then a purring and vibration of the air, so that the ear could not tell when it ended. I was wrought up, perhaps, by the strangeness of the hour and place, and my hearing quicker than at other times, but before the tremor of the bell was quite passed away, I knew there was some other sound in the air, and that the awful stillness of the vault was broken. At first I could not tell what this new sound was, nor whence it came, and now it seemed a little noise close by, and now a great noise in the distance. 
and then it grew nearer and more defined, and in a moment I knew it was the sound of voices talking. They must have been a long way off at first, and for a minute, that seemed as an age, they came no nearer. What a minute was that to me! Even now, so many years after, I can recall the anguish of it, and how I stood with ears pricked up, eyes starting, and a clammy sweat upon my face, waiting for those speakers to come. It was the anguish of the rabbit at the end of his burrow, with the ferret's eyes gleaming in the dark, and gun and lurcher waiting at the mouth of the hole. I was caught in a trap, and knew beside that contraband man had a way of sealing prying eyes and stilling babbling tongues, and I remembered poor Cracky Jones found dead in the churchyard, and how men said he had met Blackbeard in the night. These were but the thoughts of a second, but the voices were nearer, and I heard a dull thud far up the passage, and knew that a man had jumped down from the churchyard into the hole. So I took a last stare round, agonising to see if there was any way of escape. But the stone walls and roof were solid enough to crush me, and the stack of casks too closely packed to hide more than a rat. There was a man speaking now from the bottom of the hole to others in the churchyard, and then my eyes were led as by a lodestone to a great wooden coffin that lay by itself on the top shelf a full six feet from the ground. When I saw the coffin I knew that I was respited, for, as I judged, there was space between it and the wall behind enough to contain my little carcass and in a second I put out the candle, scrambled up the shelves, half stunned my senses with dashing my head against the roof, and squeezed my body betwixt wall and coffin. There I lay on one side, with a thin and rotten plank between the dead man and me, dazed with a blow to my head, and breathing hard, while the glow of torches as they came down the passage reddened and flickered on the roof above. End of chapter 3 Recording by Simon Evers